If you'd like to follow along, we'll be reading from First Peter 5, 6 through 10. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. That's again, First Peter 5, 6 through 10. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sun Valley Church of Christ. Glad you're with us this morning. I am so happy today. And I bet you're wondering why. It's a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist said, 118 Psalm, verse 24. That's one reason why I'm glad, but I'm also glad to see some of our winter members here. I have missed you. I have uh, come to the conclusion of how it is you get by saying goodbye to you guys during the summer. You get such a great joy when you get back. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept. Um, grateful you're back. Some of y'all are looking forward to the rest of everybody getting back to uh, uh, share the winter with us, if you will. What a great time it is. Today we're going to share some of God's Word together. We want to welcome our, vet, our guests, let you know that you are uh, an honored guest. We're glad you're with us. We look forward to you coming back at our next appointed time, which, in case you're wondering, uh, 6 o'clock this evening, I hear we got a good speaker in, in, in line. I think Charlie's going to get up and do the evening uh, sermon today. So if you're staying home because of me, you're going to miss out because Charlie's going to be here. So you will hear a good sermon finally. So I'm grateful you are here. Uh, grateful for Charlie and his willingness to do that for us. And next week, we're loaded up for the young men to get up and do uh, the worship for us next week, next uh, Sunday evening. So got a lot of things lined up, um, and you'll be seeing more of me uh, once the announcements get started because I fear for my life if I don't make this announcement. So uh, you all understand why. <laughs> um, enough said. Let's get on with business, right? What's this donkey named Faith? What's going on? Well, I remember one time I walked into a butcher shop and told the butcher I wanted half a rabbit. He said he doesn't split hairs. Didn't I'm here all week, folks. No. The, the, I said that for a reason. God does things according to his plan. You know, Jesus went, and when he when we read about it, the triumphal entry, it was rode on a stallion, wasn't it? Ah, uh, wrong answer. It was rode on a beautiful horse. No, it was rode on a donkey. Why? Because that's what God said. Nothing else would have done. This is what was prophesied. This is what was talked about. So Jesus rode in on his triumphal entry on a donkey, which is all right with me because that shows me victory. That's what the triumphal entry reminds us of, that God is victorious. And to get there, we need to be able to understand his word, the importance of being victorious lies upon how important we find his word. Some people find it ain't much of a thing at all, except makes good decoration on a mantle or gives us something to talk about on Sundays. But his word is important. In fact, the Bible calls it a treasure. And I am not going to steal any thunder because I heard somebody's going to be speaking on treasure tonight. And we are looking forward to that. But I do want to talk more about the idea of, of victory. Because remember way back in, in there was a, a group of people that really relied on the law. And they thought that law was victory. I want us to turn. Now we're going to be in Romans 6, but I want us to go over to verse 9 real quick. And I want us to look at a passage. 
verses 30 and 31, Romans chapter 9. He says, What shall we say then? That Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. We had a saying in Texas, you can't get there from here. They couldn't get there through the law. Their law, a law. There is no law that will take you to eternal life. There is Christ, and he will get us there. And if we will do the things that we need to do to be faithful to God, right? Because victory. What is victory? Well, and I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, Noah, because I'm going to tell you. Victory is, is, is eternal life in us. Are you hearing that? God, what's his victory? Faith overcomes the world. I get that. First John 5, 4, great song. Great, great um, song leader today. Do you recognize that? Doing such a great job. We got great song leaders. The Lord has blessed us tremendously thank you thank you michael great job appreciate it um but the idea of our faith we do things by faith not by sight we get that but faith is the victory and it's found that eternal life working in us and folks to do this we have to we have to hear me out and get to but it's a must it's a spiritual necessity to strive to get through a narrow door talked about in luke chapter 13 to give your life, to, to lay that life down, to be the person that gets through that door, to take on this life that God has given us. We have to strive. We must surrender. That old life that I once lived, I surrendered. I delivered it. I got rid of it. It's not mine no more. I don't want it anymore. I surrendered that life. And then I, the third part of, the, part of this idea of having this eternal life in me, this victory, is I make sacrifices, folks. Every day I'm making a sacrifice. Oh, I'm not trying to compare myself to Jesus hanging on a cross, Lord forbid. But that's not the only sacrifice we make. We make many of the sacrifices. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. He understands the sacrifices of letting go of the old life. Because we enjoyed it. We were comfortable with that life. It was taking us where we wanted to go. But now our minds have changed. We've been you know, given a new outlook in life, and so we let go of that old life because I didn't like where that old life was taking me anymore. So I quit riding myself to victory, and I got on a donkey named Faith. And I'm going to ride that donkey. We are going to ride this donkey together. And I know, Faith, you're taller than me, wherever you are, but I'm not calling you a donkey, okay? Now that we got that straight, let's move on. Let's get to where we're going. Chuck, I don't have any control up here. That's because I don't have it on. Never mind, Chuck, you're a good man. <laughs> this is my fault, right? God's victory, folks, is eternal life in us. And that life is lived through these things that we talked about. The striving, the surrendering, the sacrificing, the giving up. We want that victory. As we read in Romans chapter 6, we're going to look at the victory that God gives us through our faith in what he's done. The victory over slavery. Ooh, that's almost a cuss word nowadays. But it was common in the day. And whether you know it or not, you a slave. You know, victory over self and victory over sin. The question on that slavery part is who are you a slave to? And we're going to look at that. We're going to start there because slavery is, is, is a part of life. It was part of culture back in the day. And really... Uh, not to quote uh, rock and roll singer Bob Dylan or anything, but you're going to serve somebody, right? It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And those folks, hear me out, are our only two choices. So we need to learn what it means to be victorious over slavery. Paul's point, if we look at Romans chapter 6, and we look at verse 16, he says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. I bet you didn't think you were a slave to that cell phone. But every time that phone rings, you obey it. You see? You become a slave to that device. And he says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Folks, hear this. Are we seeing this? Look what he says. Do you not know? Greek word. 
Beautiful Greek word. Has a deep um, connotation to it. That word know is more than just a common knowledge. It should change who you are. Do you see that? Is your lives not changed by this knowledge? That's what Paul's saying. Don't you get this? Don't you understand what's happening? The obedient, who you obey determines where you're going to spend eternity. You see? That word no, it's a perfect active. It means something that was completed, but it's still affected. It, it, the effects of it is still going on in your life. It's changing who you are. You, sh you should be upset. Folks, this should make you mad. Not mad in a bad sense, but mad to make a difference. Right? That old devil, he'd he been out deceiving since day one. And he's got me tricked to believing that I'm doing right, but I really I'm a slave to his work. Now we have, to, we have to really catch that because there's a transformation that takes place. Look at verse 17. But thanks be to God. There it is. Woo-hoo! Come quit working, God at work. That's transformation, folks. When I get out of the way, God does his work. When I quit trying to think I know everything, God tells me I know nothing, and I, he will show me what is right. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, and catch that, of sin, not to sin, of sin, you were possessed by sin. You were in the possession of sin. Oh, oh but thanks be to God. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to what you were committed. And folks, what is he talking about that form of teaching? Well, remember, context, context, context tells us what he's talking about. Romans chapter 6 starts off with what? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul was being accused of being a grace preacher, which he's not afraid of, but he had to fix this. Because the idea of being a grace preacher in the day was he was going around telling everybody, you know what, Rick, you just go out there and sin. Do what you want because God is glorified when his grace covers you. Paul said, I didn't say that. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know, again, one of his questions that says this should change your life, that you, you when you died to sin, you, still, you can't still live in it? Or do you not know that those of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So you, were, you died with him, you were buried with him, you were raised again. That's the form of teaching. Then you became obedient. How? From the heart. Well, not from the mind, but from the heart, where everything is real. Everything takes place within the heart. Starts in the mind, yes, goes to the heart, comes out through the hands, our works, who we are, what we're done. It's, it's through this great knowledge that God has given us. We were once slaves of sin. Now, catch this too. That, that word uh, slave is a noun. And what he's saying is we gave our life. We did this. We are slaves. We did this. We are, I'm a slave to sin. I want to give my life over to sin. That's what we did. And you know, Satan wasn't kind to say, you know, Cub, do you really want to do that? He was like, woohoo, I got Cub. He's given his life to sin. He's a slave to sin. But then what happened? You became obedient. Now that's, we understand what he's saying. You started listening to God. You quit listening to that old ugly boy, devil boy thing, looking thing, thing, and started listening to God. You became obedient, and that is important. Aorist active. It is something that took place and continues to take place. You didn't hear him once. You continue to hear God's teaching. Back over in Romans chapter 6. You died to sin. You were buried with him. You were raised again to walk in the newness of life. And you keep hearing that. I no longer want to live to sin. I'm dead to sin. I want to walk in this newness of life. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. You became slaves, he said. After you obeyed from the heart, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, woohoo! no sin, I'm free from you. What does that mean? 
I'm not just free from sin. I'm freed from its stain. I'm freed from its shame. I'm freed from its damage. I'm freed from its bondage. I'm free from sin. Not that I did it. I was freed from sin. Look at he says. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Woohoo! New possession, right? We, not, different word. Slave. Now that is not a noun. It's it's a verb. <laughs> you see that how I switched? You were once an a, an object in possession of sin. Now you became obedient to God. You listened to God. You said, I am not going to be any object. I'm going to let God do his work because it's passive. So you didn't do it. God is doing it. Listening to his word, his life, his story, his truth is changing who you are from the heart. And the church said, amen. Woo. Goodbye, sin. Goodbye, slavery. I know what slavery means now. If I sit here and I let Barbara Tell me what's going on and follow Barbara. I'm a slave to Barbara. But if I want to hear righteousness and I do what righteous, I let righteousness do his work, God's work in me, I became now obedient from the heart and became a slave in the possession of righteousness. Not my own, but God. Passive God doing it in me. Amen, Paul. Thank you so much for that reminder that yes, we can be victorious. We want to ride that donkey. We want to be freed from the slavery of sin, in possession of that sin, to become slaves, a verb, in the passive, that now we are letting righteousness mold us into who God wants us to be. And what is that? Freed from sin. Victory. Woohoo! No slavery. Not slavery to the world, not slavery to the devil, not slavery to sin. Slavery to the righteousness that only can come from God. Him doing the work, passive voice. Woo! Beautiful. I am so grateful for this study this week. That's why I'm on fire. I just found out I'm free. Like that little girl on the plane, right? <laughs> like I'm free. Yeah. We are freed from sin. And that's important. Because sin once held us captive. And that's all because of what we were doing, folks. We were doing hard work tearing our lives up. I remember the story of a man having Thanksgiving dinner with a, with a surgeon. And so he was going to really impress the surgeon. So he got out his little carving knife and he was strategically and, and carefully carving that turkey up. Oh boy, that old breast that slid off the knife. And boy, he had to, and he just laid it. And he, he told that surgeon, he said, I'd make a great surgeon, wouldn't I? And the surgeon said, well, anybody could tear it apart. Let's see you put it back together. See, that's what happens. We do a great job of carving our life all up because we're slaves of sin. And God puts it all back together through his righteousness, through us being smart enough to turn our, our listening ears to that sin and open our ears to become obedient to that form of teaching, God's teaching, his salvation. Woo! Victory over slavery. We get to choose who we're slaves to. Slavery isn't bad when you're slaves of righteousness. God's righteousness. And that's cool victory. That's a donkey. We're going we're to ride that donkey of faith right through that victory of slavery. But also ourself. Our self is terrible. You know, I say that to myself every time I see myself in the mirror. You're my worst enemy. And we are. We always get in the way. Our minds, what we think, what we feel, what we think it should have been. And what it really is. And so we, we have to learn this victory. Look at verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Do you hear that? You know what, Chris? That flesh you're living in, it's weak. If we don't get nothing more, if you leave them with nothing more than that, you're leaving with a gold mine. That flesh you're living in, it's weak. Jesus told the disciples, go out and watch over while I, while I go over here and pray. Oh, your flesh is, well, your will is there, but your flesh is weak. We are weak in the flesh. Folks, we need God's strength to help us through this. And that's exactly what Paul says. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I haven't got spiritual on you here yet because you're not ready. But look at what he says. 
For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Now I don't know about you, but I'm a game show freak. I love to watch the game shows. They don't cuss as much as they do at other TVs, shows and stuff. Um, but you're always trying to win something good. Here Paul says you get a choice. You get to have something good or something bad. I mean, when, when he's talking, like the choice isn't that hard to make. You know? I don't need to be a scholar like Morgan going to school and having all those college knowledge to figure this out. I, I, I could be a sixth grade student and get this. There's things going on. Like Superman, we have a kryptonite called flesh. It's weak. Its weakness is shown in three areas, folk. Paul showed them to us right there. Number one, impurity. I know, I know. Michael, you said, well, all right, I took a shower cup. What do you mean impurity? Well, I, I'm saying that. You, you're, you're, I got you. You're clean. I get that. But the impurity that we're talking about is our lifestyle in the flesh is impurity to God. When we do things according to God, we are impure. I mean, according to the flesh, we are impure to God. We're not, we're not clean. We're not purified. That's a crazy idea, but it's true. And he goes on to say that you presented your members as slavely, uh, slaves to impurity. To impurity. You, you, again, it's not of impurity. It's not possession, but you were given yourselves to something impure, your flesh. And then you were doing what? and to lawlessness. This is where we lose the world. Lawlessness is not obeying God's commands. Remember Jesus? We did this, and we did this, and we did this, and we did all this in your name, but I will say, depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. It's either you're obeying God or you're not. God has given us very clear uh, outlines of what it means to be a Christian. Either we obey those or we don't. And when we don't, we are lawlessness. That's what God sees. When people come to you say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe you need to be baptized, God sees that as impure lawlessness. Do we get that? That is not, that is not God's plan. And so when we let the flesh, when we let other people's minds, when we let other people's teaching take us away, it takes us to impurity and lawlessness. And we think that would be bad enough. But look what he said. He goes on to say, resulting in further lawlessness. Well, lawlessness always leads us to death. They're the furthest place it can take us, to death. It separates us from God. That lawlessness, if we don't take control of that, if we don't see that, then we let it lead us. When we let ourselves lead us, it's leading us to lawlessness. Doesn't stop there because Satan never stops. He always wants to take us to the next step and the final step being death separated from God and we don't want that that is something God said I I died to make sure you don't have to go through that I sent Jesus he came and died on the cross for you so you don't have to worry about lawlessness leading to further lawlessness but look what he says look at verse 20 for when you were slaves of sin right now in possession of sin you were freed in regard to righteousness. I don't have to obey righteousness. I don't got to do nothing at all. I just do what I want to do. See, I was freed from it. I, didn't, I wasn't bound by it. It wasn't getting in my way. That idea of being a slave of sin kept us away from obeying righteousness, resulting in lawlessness and further lawlessness to death. Now look at verse 21. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed? Let's get this right. Let's, let's understand what he's saying. Therefore, what fruit or benefit were you deriving or holding? Can you imagine this? Look what he's saying. This is like a court scene. You're going in front of the judge holding your machine gun saying, I didn't do it. You know what I mean? What fruit are, are you then holding 
from the things of which you are now ashamed. What fruit does sin bring you? Ashamed. You're ashamed. You're going to stand before God ashamed. That's your fruit. I don't want that fruit. That's craziness. He goes on to say, for the outcome of those things is what? It's death. It's death. Now keep in mind, context tells us that he's not talking physical death. He's talking about a spiritual death here. Romans is very, very uh, intricate with the idea of spiritual death, physical death. Here, he's definitely talking about spiritual death. You are carrying that great life that you call life, and it ain't nothing but death. And you're going to go to God standing there with death in your hands going, I'm ashamed. That's my fruit. This is not something we want, folks. I hope. This is the greatness of the book of Romans. It helps us through these questions that we might have as we go through the troubles that we go through. When we stand before God, we have a chance to hold his fruit, not the fruit of death. So it's all about how we measure things, right? There's these two guys who are assigned of finding the height of a flagpole. Well, a woman walked by and asked, what are you doing? They said, well, we've got to figure out the height of this flagpole, but Sven didn't bring his ladder. So the lady went to her car, she got her wrench, and she took the bolts out, and she laid that flag down, that flagpole, right? And she took out the tape, and she measured it from tip to tip, and she told him, that's 21 feet, 6 inches, she said. She walked away. Well, one of the engineers looked at the other and laughed, said, a lot of good, that does it, it does us. He said, we asked for height, and she gave us length. We're asking God to measure us according to what? His standard. What's his standard? Righteousness. And if we don't live in that righteousness, if we don't allow his word to transform us into being slaves of that righteousness, then we are going to be eternally separated from God. And when we allow his word to transform us, we are never left short. Okay? We will always bear fruit of the life of a kingdom dweller. So, sin, we want that victory. We'll ride that donkey over the slavery. We'll ride that donkey over the victory over self. And what about sin itself? Look what Paul said in verses 22 and 23. He says, but now having been freed from the sin, okay, that's good, we're freed from that sin. Don't want, not just sin, but the sinful life, the ashamedness of it. And enslaved to God. Woohoo! See? Now we are enslaved to God. You derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome of eternal life. Okay, result. Death, result. With God, sanctification. That's what I want. Sanctification. Sanctified from those who are dead. Set apart from those who are dead. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Faith frees us from sin and enslaves us to God. And that faith brings the fruit of God's promises, which is what? Eternal life. Yeah, we are living the fruit of eternal life. Because we have turned away from the sin. And that faith does not earn love, but embraces God's gift of what? Eternal life. It's in us. Ride that donkey. It's faith. Trusting in God. And to the, what the world might say, splitting hairs, keep on splitting. Ride the donkey. Don't let them give you a horse. Don't let them give you a Corvette. Don't let them give you a Tesla. Ride the donkey. The donkey is what gets us that victory. Faith is the victory. See. Jesus rode a donkey. Can, can you imagine being Jesus going, what, I have to ride a donkey? You know, Les is riding a Tesla. Can I have a Tesla? No, I got to ride a donkey. No, Jesus didn't say that because he knew what God asked him. He knew what God wanted of him. He wanted faith. He wanted obedience. So Jesus rode that donkey in triumphal entry. And folks, we will ride that donkey of faith in victory. 
Yeah, if we just let God do his work. He'll give us that victory over slavery. He'll give us that victory over self. And he'll give us that victory over sin. See, sin's the work of the devil. Sin is what Satan uses to keep us away from God. And you know, he can't force us. And like we showed in, in, in the verb usage and the writing of the Greek shows it's us that allow that sin to do that to us, to take us away from God. I want to encourage you today. You have an opportunity right now at victory because you just heard the word of God and you have seen that sin will destroy your relationship with God and bring you to what? Death. You don't want that? We don't want that for you. We want to encourage you to have that victory over sin. And remember we said, go back to verses one through four. How do we have that victory over sin? How do we have that victory over death? Buried with him in baptism. If you're, if you're here this morning, you have not been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, please make that decision. Pray about it. Think about it. There are people here that will study with you, including myself, that will study with you and show you the importance of baptism, washing away sins. And if you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, you've asked God to wash away your sins, don't forget about the victory. See, Satan tries to throw things at us to make us think we're defeated. Yeah, does things like give us short preachers and stuff like that, and we think we're defeated. No, defeat is when you're separated from God. And nobody can do that to you except yourself. So what, what happened? You know, last week, Carnella come down. She was going through some problems. She asked for strength. The congregation prayed. Look at her today. Look at that smile on her face. Huh? Look at that glow. Her family's with her. Doesn't that remind you of somebody when they were struggling and they went in a garden and prayed and God sent angels to strengthen? Prayer works. If you got something in your life that's bothering you, Satan's trying to use it to pull you from the body of Christ, Ask God for strength. Take this opportunity to be part of a family that loves you, that wants to strengthen you. Today, if we can help you by leading you to the waters of baptism or say a prayer with you to strengthen you, let us do that. Take this opportunity right now to come forward as we stand and we sing.